Before we start this episode, I just want to make sure we have a content warning in place because there will be some discussion on this episode with very graphical uh, mention and explanation of um, the death of animals and uh, everything that comes with it. So if you are squeamish, if you can't handle that, then this is probably not the episode for you. Um, but we're trying to keep this as clear and as um how do you say as a uh, as matter of fact as it's possible in this context so here we go it's the 15th of september 2021 and you are listening to curiously polar hello ladies and gentlemen we are back i'm chris there is henry and mario and mario how's everyone doing <laughs> Doing fine, thank you. Doing Fantastic. Uh, How about you? Oh, yeah, okay. Jugg juggling <laughs> a lot of things, but uh, that's kind of normal for me. Um, we have, uh, well, we have a, an interesting topic today, talking about the EU seal ban, um, which <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's a slightly touchy topic for some, but uh, we might be able to bring some light into the whole debate, which has been going on for I don't know, since I was a kid, pretty much. So, um, yeah. Possibly even, even, even longer. Even longer. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, then we have, of course, the Polo Newsreel. Before we go into that, we have a piece of feedback that we received uh, from Robert Spajari. I think, <laughs> I think you have to pronounce it with a <laughs> strong Italian accent. Um <laughs> Do you I want like me to do it. <laughs> he writes. I like to. I like the way you. At least it's, Sorry. Go ahead. I'll, at least it would not be exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> if I said it, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I. I don't know. I have to. I have to over dramatize it. Of course. Um. He writes on uh, on one of the. Uh, last episodes. I like the way you develop the topic. Another thing people can do is give support to scientists. So they are heroes of our age. Here, uh, here are some related questions I am following. How can animals other than humans affect carbon markets? Let them do the work. Uh, what is the value of oceanic blue carbon? I'm posting a link to the most thrilling webinar I've seen this year, which I'm hoping will excite people like Mario. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and so Mario, he's handing this straight off to you. What, <laughs> what, what about the blue carbon? No, it is. This, did you watch is. this webinar? I watched a little bit, but uh, you only shared it yesterday and <laughs> with me, and uh, and I uh, I didn't have time to watch it all. But it is a, uh, exciting. It's an exciting topic, and especially, it is uh, important that we do not just think about the land masses when we talk about the climate, when we talk about the ocean, when we talk about carbon, the carbon cycle. Well, the ocean produces more oxygen than the all of the land plants. So we are dependent very much on the ocean for uh, the oxygen we breathe. I think more than, than half of the oxygen that, right. uh, that we breathe is, is coming from the ocean. So it is very important. The, oxy the, uh, the ocean is also a a, a, an enormous player in the carbon cycle because it can absorb CO2, it can release CO2 and other climate forces like methane and other uh, gases, but uh, especially it can, uh, it can the, the ocean ecosystem or the ocean system, because it's not just the living part of the ocean, can store carbon or release carbon, depending on the acidity, for example. So we have the carbon that comes and is dissolved in the water can be captured by plants and made into biological material. It can be made into skeletons of some uh, phytoplankton, for example. And uh, these uh, skeletons can fall into onto the sediment and become, with time, limestone. And, uh, and that is a sequestration of carbon. So, uh, so we have to to make sure that and we have to like one of the advocates uh, uh, or no, if you want to advocate uh, the ocean's function, you can also say well the the capturing of carbon into a stable uh, stable form is happening 
in the ocean mostly and that is uh, that is very important if the ocean acidifies so if the ocean becomes more uh, the pH of the ocean decreases then the limestone is corroded and the CO2 comes out into the uh, into the atmosphere again so and acidification ocean acidification is an effect of climate change hmm. so it's we are we are uh, like the ocean is an enormous player and these seminars and there are several others that were fortunately youtube is suggesting other seminars or or talks there are some that are extremely extremely important i uh, saw one that was especially good uh, by uh, let me see here uh, i saved it and now i need to to find it <laughs> In my watch later, there is uh, uh, by the uh, um, what's it called, the Potsdam Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, 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 the Potsdam Earth System Klim Analysis Institute for Klimafolgenabschätzung, yes. yeah. which Earth uh, System means Analysis climate, climate research, yes. <laughs> exactly climate climate, uh, cl climate effect research. I yeah, think. and uh, and uh, Professor Stefan Ramsdorf yeah. has a few really good uh seminars in the, under their youtube channel uh, in in english and in uh, in german that uh, surely would interest robert yeah. <laughs> I, I, so I i highly I, recommend mr ramsdorf he's uh, he's really uh, important in that yeah. field yeah. and very good yes. um, and he's a very very vocal voice as well in in that um, yeah. whole debate very good yeah yeah and he's a scientist so uh, let us <laughs> Move over to. Oh, by the way, um, thank you for the question for for the feedback. I um, um, I encourage everyone who watches this or listens to this. If you have questions, um, there's several places that you can reach us. There's our uh, Twitter uh, channel, Curiously Polar. There's our YouTube channel, which is linked under every episode. So um, comments there as well. And uh, yeah, let's get some discussion going here. The Polar Newsreel. It is time for, well, for what? Let's uh, go A through jingle. them one by one. Um, what are we uh, talking about here with the Troubled Waters article? This one. Yes. Um, this is uh, like to keep uh, this episode mostly oceanic or mm -hmm. coastal. Uh, one thing that uh, that has happened in recent years, happily, is that uh, uh, a lot of uh, marine uh, wildlife, and especially megafauna, so large vertebrates, large animals, have been protected. Those that uh, were not directly overfished, uh, um, and uh, and some of these, like in this case, uh, marine mammals, and especially uh, the uh, sea lion populations along the southern coast of South America, we're talking about Chile here, have increased in numbers dramatically. They were hunted down to uh, very low numbers. And uh, with the protection since the uh, mid 20th century, uh, decrease also in the demand for, for products, uh, they have increased. And uh, there are so many that uh, are now conflicting with the interest of uh, small-scale fisheries, artisanal fisheries and small-scale fisheries along the coast of Chile. So that um, found it difficult to cohabit, found it difficult to cohabit with these uh, increasing numbers of, of sea lions because the sea lions are competing for the same resource, the same fish. They destroy the gear, they uh, bite the fish and without consuming it totally when it is the fish has been captured in the nets so it's very visible for the fishermen that the sea lions have been there because they find half eaten half chewed fish in their nets not only the uh, broken nets and uh, and they say i mean in this study which is by the university of oxford that is reported here uh, is uh, putting their livelihoods below their minimum wage requirements for for surviving and uh, so we have uh, we have a conflict that is also a conflict of survival of the local populations so the sea and, lion uh, populations coming back means difficulties for local fisheries 
Yes, exactly. And we're not talking about industrial fisheries. We're talking about the people that have been like settling there for mm. like, the coastal maybe, fishes, maybe yeah. centuries, centuries. I mean, if you've traveled along the coast of South America, there are plenty of small villages and uh, and uh, and lots of sea lions. <laughs> so, so you can see that it's it's a problem. It's a it's a, an economic problem and a social problem as well. Um, so. How so. to solve this? Well, the, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, something that can be solved. But one of the one of the solutions is uh, keeping the growth of the populations of sea lions at a lower pace. So removing some of the animals, which means culling some of the animals. And these uh, cullings have been called several places, not only in South America, Britain, for example, as a culling of seals mm, to keep the population at the at a slow growing rate so as to protect the ecosystem but also to protect the local the local economy it's it's very difficult to find a balance between uh, conservation on one hand and um economical and and, and social stability for communities um, on the other hand and to yeah this article here goes really in um into depth in, in, in that particular example but we can find it all over the place and particularly and that's what we're going to talk um later on in the episode if it touches um indigenous um communities which have a long tradition um and um a very focused diet um dietary limitations then it has a much much bigger impact uh, on on them than it does have for um, larger communities, which are like for fishing, for example, more relying on on trawler fisheries than the small scale local fishery, which is yeah largely supplying um, the small um, coastal communities, right? Yeah, right. and as a, as an example of uh, of managing an ecosystem, one could take a a forest ecosystem, which is more visible to most humans. Uh, if we have a forest we have a lot of different species an original forest an, an old growth forest there are lots of species of um, plants there are animals there are of different kinds from from insects to and bacteria and fungi and 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 up to the bigger vertebrates if we remove the forest we reduce or if we cut it down we reduce the biodiversity we reduce the diversity of species and uh, if we then leave it to itself it will not grow into this primary growth forest or an old growth forest it will grow actually wild we'll get lots of brambles you'll have lots of other species that are not making it stable so you'll have uh, acacia for example in europe is uh, growing very fast much faster than the original oaks or other plants uh, that uh, we then have a very short life cycle they would die and increase the problems because it would become a, uh, it would uh, acidify the uh, soil and make it difficult for other plants to grow the original plants to grow so one way of managing a forest to restore the ecosystem restoring an ecosystem we're talking here is to control which species are growing at which speed and introduce them at the right time so that you can at one point that have a target which is similar to the original forest but it, it requires uh, an active Active uh, management action yeah. and active management yeah. if we want to if we want to do it in in reasonable time otherwise we just leave it to the uh, to nature and that would take a little longer to to balance to balance the ecosystem a little yeah. longer well let's look at a different area of the ecosystem how about sea otters and that i think has something to do with uh, carbon as well Yes, um, I chose the, this uh, this article, which is referring to also the scientific cute? article, and the, the, the sea so otters, cute. which yeah, the sea otters are uh, different from the river otters um, of uh, of Europe, but they have also uh, a very uh, they are very cute. They are bigger <laughs> than the <laughs> they are they are very bigger than the <laughs> very much bigger than the than the river otter that we have also in the sea here in Europe, and uh, they have been hunted down to yeah in the end of the eighteen uh, hundreds there were about two thousand animals that were left. Just oh, very that few. was very and close were, to extinction. Yeah, very yes. close to extinction. And then they have been uh, protected, and they have been protected since uh, yeah. 
yeah, probably, yeah, the, I don't remember the protection, but uh, they came around the uh, beginning of the 19th century. And, uh, and the conservation efforts have allowed the otter population to rebound, and now they are quite abundant. If you, for example, have had the chance of going to Monterey Bay in California, there are otters in the kelp forest. Otters are ecosystem engineers. They actually help the ecosystem. They rem they remineralize part of the uh, part of the ecosystem. They eat uh, like uh, mussels, seashells, molluscan, and other other uh, invertebrates. And uh, they actually, with the action of looking for the prey, they actually trim the forest. So they are actually doing what I was saying before. They are managing the kelp forest. And this makes it grow even better and capturing carbon. So this is this is uh, how uh, I like to balance the, the gloomy <laughs> the gloomy uh, picture of the of the previous article is that in some cases the natural populations are actually increasing the productivity of the ecosystem and the ability of the ecosystem to capture carbon and the river otter along the northwest um, American coast is uh is one example cool very cool um next piece of the polar newsreel again has a i think a pretty it, positive slant it stays in the yeah it stays in the in, in the same realm we're we're, and, we're, uh, we're keeping the mood high um this yes, is about whales it's, it's very nice. and how they can help cool the earth this is another article in bbc yes. future planet Yes, and it's also uh, it's also uh, looking at a scientific paper that uh, has uh, been uh, analyzing or uh, estimating how much uh, a healthy whale population can add or can help uh, for combating climate change, and uh, because. I mean, we're saying about we were uh, we're talking last in the last episode about uh, uh, about climate blues and how uh, actually the episode on the IPCC um, report about climate blues and how people can get very depressed uh, about <laughs> about hearing how bad things goes, but go, but uh, but it is. Uh, it is important also to see that the whale populations are rebounding. There are a lot of whales uh, that uh, are a lot of whale populations that are growing in large numbers, and also whales are keystone piece, species, but also ecosystem engineers, and uh, they help in trimming the ecosystem and capturing carbon and. Uh, uh, adding, especially for the whales, the whales add iron to the ocean, add fertilizers. So they eat the krill, the fish, and w after digesting it, they they eject it from their body. This is okay. And, this is uh, about whale poo. You, you, you it's can about say whale it. poo, <laughs> exactly. And uh, and whale excrements are actually rich in iron and. The uh, and the um, iron is deposited or is uh, ejected in the ecosystem in the upper layers where the phytoplankton is mostly is mostly active and uh, trends upwelling that's happening here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a biologically mediated up, upwelling and uh, the uh, there has been also. Uh, attempt an attempt to fertilize the ocean with iron um, in the uh, in the Antarctic converge convergence, um, so as to artificially add the iron. But whales are much more effective at uh, what they are doing, and uh, and this is good news for the ecosystem. More whales means mean uh, uh, actually a, a better, healthy ecosystem, more carbon capture by the ocean. It's not only that; it's also um, when they when they die, they um take the carbon dioxide down to the ground of the ocean. So if we um, instead take the whales out of the equation and um, just just hunt them, um, we release that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the numbers in that paper are just mind boggling how much, how many tons of carbon dioxide could have been saved. They're talking about uh, almost 500,000 cars yearly if the whale population would have stayed on a pre-industrial level. So that's just something um, to to take into consideration when we, when we talk about restoring um, whale populations. It's not only nice to have nice whale watching trips, it also helps the planet and is one part of the equation how to 
handle um, carbon capturing, right? How to handle the crisis that's unfolding in front of us. Yeah, yeah. and this uh, this system of carbon offsetting is, uh, I yes. mean, we are talking here not about uh, a paper or uh, news that are publicized by uh, by activism or uh, or by just uh, lone scientists. Here we are talking about the International Monetary Fund producing estimates of uh, how much whales are worth and how much they can do to help fighting climate change. I find it very interesting how everything is connected in some way. I'm yeah, and that's something that, that, that mankind um, still does not grasp or comprehend in its full extent. We still have a lot of debates in in day-to-day -day politics where we just change one minor variable in the entire equation and think that's isolated. None of that is isolated. Yeah. It always touches other um, dimensions. And we still think we can just do some little harm in that area and it's not too bad for the entire equation. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a domino effect. All of that is connected, so we have to see the yeah. bigger picture, which is really difficult to, to comprehend mm -hmm. in, in, in a number of ways. Yeah, and uh, actually one way of trying to make people understand, the global population to understand, is to put money in it. And this is why the, the article is referred also into in this, uh, in this uh, uh, BBC article is by the International Monetary Fund, is trying to put a value on the whales. And yes. uh, they say, well, you know, like if you have benefits like the carbon, of course, the cost of carbon offsetting and uh, other benefits like better fisheries, ecotourism and others. Uh, a gray whale, so the whales that you see along, also along the, the uh, west coast of, uh, of North America, is worth over its whole life, life cycle about $2 million. And uh, if you take the total whale stock I mean, all of the whales in the ocean, they're probably over one uh, trillion dollars worth of, of services, of ecosystem services and of doing That's this. In, an interesting <laughs> way to put a, put a price tag on something. But is, exactly. isn't, that, isn't that a bad development that we have to put a price tag onto well, something that we have to value well, economically you to know, protect it? You know, I think... If you want to talk to people who are um, mainly uh, incentivized by economy, then you have to speak their language. I think that's not a bad thing then. And it's also it's also interesting to uh, to think about uh, the cost of a whale. Like a whale, you say, let's say it's uh, two million dollars for the whole life cycle of a whale. And if you go on the market, for example, here in in Norway, whale meat is sold at uh, about yeah, eight, nine, see, ten dollars a kilo, and a whale like a, a minke whale, there are six tons. So you can see there is a discrepancy between what we pay if we want to <laughs> take slight, yeah. whale a whale in pieces and eat it, and uh, what actually a whale is worth if you talk about it in in general global terms, and and it's yeah, it's one of maybe one of the best arguments for for conserving whales and not and not eating them. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay, so I think that allows us to move on over to the main topic of this. Again, the, the episode title is Unintended Consequences, the U seal ban and indigenous sea hunters. Um, how do we kick this off? I think well, I don't know. We have one article in the... Um, Shall under the umbrella of, of, of the newsreel, which we can use to actually kick that off. All right. That would be this one. Monitors of change in differing ecosystems. So we talked uh, a lot in the newsreel about restoring ecosystems, but also um, managing ecosystems. And I think that's a, a very good example. And that's another article brought up um, by Mario. So um, yes. you want to introduce that? Yes, exactly. Um, I gladly do so. Now, uh, Gary Stenson is the uh, head of marine mammal research at the DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada, and Mike Hamill is uh, another good colleague of mine, and Tore Haug here at the Institute of Marine Research in Tromsø. Are, uh, have authored this paper, which uh, uh, actually looks at uh, globally at harp seals. It's one of the 
uh, seal species in the North Atlantic and the most abundant seal species. Uh, and uh, we are looking at uh, at a quite a complex article if you're not a scientist, but important it's also is very long. To, but, uh... Uh, yeah, it's it's very long. <laughs> it's it's a scientific article. It's not an article by the BBC or yes. or uh, or CNN. So it's it's a little bit difficult. But uh, if we look at uh, the uh, figure one, maybe uh, Chris, you can put up the figure one with the with the population the distribution. Yeah, we have uh, in gray uh, in the North Atlantic a picture of the North Atlantic from Canada to Europe and including Greenland and Iceland. And in the grayed out area, we have the range of the uh, harp seal. So they go from northeastern Canada, between the, the Baffin Bay between Canada and Greenland. And then uh, along the southeast coast of Greenland up to north of Iceland and the uh, North Atlantic north of Iceland uh, up to the Ice Edge. And uh, and then from uh, in the east, uh, they go north of Norway to the Barents Sea and the White Sea up to uh, uh, the uh, Novaya Zemlya area. So this is for the benefit of those of you who are not watching the video podcast, but they're just listening to it. Just, uh, <laughs> just and just. I now, the, there, there, uh, the there are more listeners than viewers, by the way. <laughs> exactly. That's good. <laughs> That's good. This is what a podcast should be, yes. I think. <laughs> uh, so you you don't you don't have to watch our faces. <laughs> yes. Speak um, for yourself. The, exactly. <laughs> of course, of course. I mean, not everybody can be as handsome as you are, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> anyway. Exactly. Um, so the uh, the populations uh, the the harp seal is a species, but there are three distinct populations mostly, and uh, the uh, coming from the east we have a small white sea population, so the uh, the area around the Kola Peninsula, and uh, going into the Barents Sea we have a Greenland sea population, which is east of Greenland, so on, around along the coast of Greenland, depending on the period of the life cycle and then we have a northwest atlantic population which goes from the from uh, um, the gulf of st lawrence and uh, up to, into baffin bay and uh, the areas in arctic canada between arctic canada and greenland and uh, and these three populations have been heavily hunted and uh, uh, the Redu reduction in the hunting due to several factors, among which the uh, seal ban or the seal product ban by the EU uh, and, and others, have resulted in a rebound of the populations. And uh, if we go to the graph, uh, I think it was figure three. Here it is. Chris can put it up. We can see the graph of the uh, uh, evolution of the numbers, the estimation of the numbers and uh, uh, of the three populations. So uh, uh, between 1945 and 2020, actually 2019, there was last uh, big uh, estimation. We can see that the the population of the of the White Sea, so the uh, the uh, easternmost population, is remained quite stable, and is remained quite low also because the ice uh, has been very, uh, very uh, variable, and the ice is important for the harp seal reproduction, and uh, and they are at about yeah just below half a million seals. The population in the uh, uh, Greenland Sea, so the the central population has uh, fluctuated uh, from just above two million to uh, a million and a half, and uh, this is also an area where the ice has changed very much uh, in recent years. There has been a reduction in the ice extent, but also a, um, a, a fragmentation of the ice. And uh, if we look at the uh, at the other curve, so the green curve, we see the population in the Northwest Atlantic, which had been heavily hunted. This is the hunt in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, principally, even if even though the population goes up to the Baffin Bay area and is hunted also by the Greenlandic and uh, Canadian Inuit uh, population in Octitut and others. And uh, they go in the uh, mid-50s uh, uh, at uh, 
2.5 million, and there is a reduction until the 70s, where we have the first actions against uh, seal hunting and the protection. And from the just below 2 million, they are now estimated at almost 8 million. This is an explosion so in, almost. Yes. So in 50 years, we have an explosion of the population with a few uh, ups and downs. It looks a little bit like the graph of what I hope my investments in the bank are. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Which, the orange line or the green line? <laughs> I, I think that mine are mostly the orange line because I'm not very good <laughs> at investing. But, uh, but, um, but uh, it is a, an incredible rebound of the population and it's uh, actually creating a few problems for the fishermen in the the small fisheries in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and also for the ecosystem in general because of course these seals have to eat something in and they are reducing the number of uh, of uh, of uh, fish in the area yeah so uh, so this is the uh, this is looking at the population of seals uh, that are affected by the EU seal ban, one of the populations, and uh, and uh, what the effect of the EU seal ban has had since the 2009. And what we could see on the numbers is very clear that we started at a rather stable development or, or a stable amount of um, of individuals in that species, and that dropped tremendously through um, hunting. And we're talking about a half a million. Um, of that population just in the um, northwest Atlantic area around the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So where did that start it from that we actually had seen some um, positive effects, positive developments, and that actually um, originates in the, in the mid-60s already when uh, Radio Canada in um, northeast Canada um, aired a video piece which um, was called uh, Les Grands Forts de la Banquise or the Great Seals or the Pack Ice and um, that showed the the clubbing of um, harp seal pops. It's a very graphical video. Um, um, we will put it in, in the show notes. I'll place some of this here on the screen and I do remember as a kid that that was somehow in the media and that it was the worst thing in the world and uh it was supported by very graphic uh, imagery, photography. I'm a photographer, so I know mm -hmm. the, the about the power of visuals of pictures, and uh, that was very much in use uh, in that context. So um, tell us a bit more about and, this. And that video um, that caused a number of, of, of media, um, of newspaper articles. And one newspaper article that was uh, particularly influential was a Montreal-based German-speaking newspaper, so from the German minority in Montreal. And that um, then got picked up by newspapers in Germany. So in Germany, you have one of the hotspots of the outcry that um, got created by that. Um, the whole video got um, highly criticized later on by um, con con uh, conservationists and uh, indigenous um, people groups who claim that the, um, the person that's actually clubbing seals there and is actually just skinning the seal and leaves the carcass on the ice has been paid by the filmmakers to do so and is not showing the actual practice. And that has been a high, um, highly emotional debate about that. However, what actually happened, it created a global outcry on uh, killing seals because it's the beautiful, um, fluffy, white, cuddly um, pups of the harp seals, which do not stay white for very long. It's about, I think, 17, 18 days. Let it be three weeks um, after birth. So you have to be very um, fast after birth to uh, actually um, get this white fur, which was largely um, used for the um, fashion industry in, in Europe, actually. So uh, the largest market for fur seal, uh, seal fur, was actually the, the, um, the European market. So that outcry has then turned in the, um, in the early 70s into a very sustained campaign um, to convince um, much of the world that the protesters were saving those cuddly seals from uh, murderous killers up in the Arctic. So that painted a picture, a very emotional picture, and that's exactly what uh, what you just said, Chris. Um, it used 
highly graphical pictures and and videos and really um, showed those cute little pops um, got just clopped um, brutally by um, those um, bad hunters and Europe, since European uh, Europe was that kind of a um, primary market for um, seal fur and products that of course led to a reaction and um, the European economic community which is kind of the grandfather of today's European Union they decided already in 1983 to ban the import of white harp seal uh, pop fur and the European Union later extended that ban to all kind of steel products in 2009, citing um, uh, moral concerns. And what happened here is that um, a huge conservationist um, campaign um, led by the large organizations in, in, in that um, uh, industry and that business um, turned really a global campaign on a steel hunt. And the ban that was um, put in place here had the positive side effect that the ecosystem got restored or the, the population number not only got restored but exploded it really skyrocketed as we've seen in the uh, in, in the graph early on so why is that a big question and actually up to date it's a very political question it's one of the major reasons why the european union still has not been confirmed as an observer in the arctic council because there is still a huge debate on that particular um, ban, on that particular law, even though in 2015 the European Union added onto that, amended that ban and just said indigenous communities are allowed to import products, to sell stuff. However, indigenous groups, in largely in Canada, in uh, Nunavut, um, say that this amendment is not clearly communicated. It's um, the ban is much louder in communication than this amendment that would allow local indigenous groups to actually sell seal products to tourists. So tourists coming to um, uh, Greenland or Northeast Canada still um, are under the impression they can't buy seal fur, for example, um, or certain seal products. Seal pup fur, the white fur, that was the, the initial... Um, reason to actually start that big um, discussion here is still banned and that's for good reason however Canada has um, loosened that regulation of banning um, seal hunt uh, a bit and this year the I think the quota was 400 400,000 animals in the past years that quota has never been um, reached completely by the hunters even if we would tack the 400,000 um, uh, with a population of nearly 8 million just in that area it would be um, a sustainable amount however we have a huge development here there are um, a lot of factors um, playing in and one is when you visit um, local communities very remote communities um, indigenous communities in the Baffin Bay area you will see that uh, for those communities, the seal hunt is a largely traditional way of um, of supplying your family, your village. Indigenous hunting includes the entire animal. They're not just taking the fur to to sell it to tourists. They actually use the fur for um, for for making clothes for themselves, but they also eat the meat. Of course, they use the bones to make tools and so on. So they use traditionally the entire animal the big outcry that happened in the 60s and 70s was based on a sealing industry that was only interested in the fur and the blubber of the of the animal to actually produce um, oil and uh, and clothing of course so the seal ban or the seal product ban has had the positive um, side effect that the industry itself was marginalized again. So we, we, we talk about a decline of around 90 to 95% only in Canada of the um, sealing industry. If you look into the communities of those sealing um, uh, companies, then of course you have uh, some, some very tragic developments um, in, in the area of the Gulf of St. Lawrence where um, communities have uh, really plummeted in, uh, in numbers because of 
um, getting yeah getting taken away one of their major industries. When you see uh, in those areas you have very very high unemployment rates, then um, those industries are even more valued to to add something to the labor market. So there are, of course are always two sides to to uh, to the medal. However, I think the the biggest challenge in that is, and that's what we uh, had throughout all the topics today with the with the newsreel on, um, on on conservation and finding the balance, is really to look at the big picture. If we ban um, the trade of seal products, it's not only affecting the large industry, it's affecting indigenous communities which have a different tradition, a different way, a different use of the entire animal. They're not killing seals to sell the fur, they're killing the animal to have the meat and selling the fur is a side product. And the ban has taken that income source, which is very important for the small communities, particularly for the winter season when it's very difficult for them to to um, create an income, has taken that income away. And even with the 2015 amendment, we still don't see that that income has uh, come back to communities. So seal products are still kind of a, of a, of a taboo for uh, tourists to buy. That's uh, something you can really observe when you travel in the areas. Well, and 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 I mean, I've been born uh, the end of the 1960s, so I came of age in the 1980s, and um, the the uh, seal hunting discussion or very emotional discussion with all the imagery that went with it had a, had a big made a big impression on me back then. And uh, of course, it 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 exactly. It exactly reached uh, the goal that it wanted to reach. It and was I, very, very successful. And the, I didn't. Use, I, 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 I yeah. it took it took me many years to to really see more than just that one side of things. So this is really interesting for me to see. The it campaign is, and, would yeah. probably look different um, today with uh, social media at <laughs> present and all those different media sources. Uh, I think the the scarcity of media channels back in the days has added to the success of the campaign, certainly. And the few prominent figures like Brigitte Bardot. Here's, here's uh, a good like example of this. Yeah. Um, mm. Here's a here's a tweet with a photo of uh, Brigitte Bardot <laughs> in the 1980s uh, hugging a baby seal uh, in yes. the ice, which. It's, yeah. it's a and, bit of a uh, controversial I, thing in this in yeah. this post, right? It is, and uh, and of course, like we uh, like with every, like you 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 mentioned it before, Henry, um, the uh, the hunt or hunting seal has been performed by different um, social uh, ethnic groups and uh, and economic uh, groups for different reasons, and uh, of course uh, for the uh, for the Inuits and for uh, other local indigenous communities, uh, seals have uh, both a social economic uh, value, they have nutritional value, they have a cultural value, and they are part of the identity of the, uh, of, uh, of the communities. Uh, Paul-Emile Victor, uh, he uh, uh, published uh, a, a, a book, or a, I think it was, it was several books about uh, the people of the seal as the Inuits in, in Easter Greenland. And um, and it is and the uh, Netzilik uh, Inuit Netzit is a seal. Of course, in this case, it's a it's a ring seal. But uh, but it is uh, it is the seal as uh, as a group of animals is very important for for the Inuit. The other aspect that we were talking about before is how to balance an ecosystem that has been disturbed and how to make it return to a stable and resilient. Uh, ecosystem and uh, especially in northeastern Canada with the uh, drop of the uh, with the big uh, crisis of the cod in the banks and uh, uh, so a removal of the cods and and a probably a synergistic effect with also other climatic effects uh, at the time uh, the uh, reduction in the number of seals at the same time and the increase, rapid increase in the number of seals, but not in the cod population. We have had a, uh, has given a, a terrible blow to the local communities, to the fishing communities also, like 
like not indigenous, <laughs> um, if we can call them that way, and uh, and it, it is it has destabilized the ecosystem, uh, and uh, and this is this is a problem. The Norwegians have had uh, as the main reason in recent years for allowing the take of seals of harp seals. They have had uh, the uh, control of the seal population or the growth of the seal population, and uh, they have somehow also because of the ban in in the, in the EU the EU ban in 2009, they have uh, they practically desisted in their intent uh, of controlling the seal population. Uh, it's mostly like keeping up uh, some tradition for a one or two boats and um, keeping out the possibility of. Uh, of, of going and hunting because there is too little hunt now to control the population and uh, so now the seals are somehow going rogue some would say uh, it's it's good to see that but it's, it's, uh, this, it's increased... this green curve we're talking about yes it's a green curve that increases between the uh, 60s or maybe from the 70s up to now it increases uh, by six million uh, so it's a uh, it's like if you say that that's uh, that's a lot of a lot of seals. When a population increases, you have an increase in uh, in disease. In you have a decrease in the blubber uh, thickness, so in the fitness of the individuals, because there are too many for themselves for their own good. Or they are increasing too much for their own good, and that is uh, and they are all fighting for the same the food and and so on. Yeah, and uh, so it's it's interesting to see what the how this curve how this curve will uh, will continue. But uh, you know, I mean, even though it might not be a Malthusian effect at the at the end, but uh, we still see something that uh, that could be uh, could be problematic. Uh, in the eighties, there was a, a big invasion of uh, harp seals into the Norwegian fjords. Uh, and uh, and that uh, actually was created a, a big problem for the for the fishermen for the local coastal fisheries also here in Norway, in an area where harp seals are usually not seen. So it is uh, and uh, another the incidence of uh, diseases like the foci distemper virus, like uh, we have had in the uh, we have seen in the North Sea. That's uh, also a, a consequence uh, possibly of. Uh, among other factors of the increase in the population density and of course increase of pollution and decrease in uh, in the uh, immune uh, capacities of the individuals because of the pollutants we can see that the, the biggest increase of the population just happened in the area around the gulf of st lawrence and uh, newfoundland where the the ban had the biggest impact it's a it's a rather small area in that gulf um on the islands of uh, of Madeline and the Prince Edward Island, the the area is very specific here. So we we have a a bay that has a tradition of being covered largely in sea ice, keeping only the main um, navigating channel open, and that sea ice is the place where the harp seals um, give birth. So recently, we also can see that not only the hunting had an impact, but also um, the development of sea ice and now we see the sea ice is getting less and less um, the sea ice is not as stable and reliable anymore so we see that the sea ice in the Gulf of St. Lawrence particularly is um, significantly shrinking so we see new campaigns coming up uh, for the exact same animal um, trying to raise awareness of the climate change impact plus sealing impact um, in that regard and if you look at the entire campaign um, starting in the early 70s, going to the late 80s, you see also a huge change of how um, conservational agencies or, um, let's say, organizations like the uh, like Greenpeace or the World Wildlife Fund um, deal with a topic. And Greenpeace here had a, a very interesting um, development. They first um, teamed up with the association of the fishermen in the area because the fishermen were arguing that the seals are actually um, depleting the cot population. Later on, when the uh, highly graphical pictures were published, uh, Greenpeace changed site, abandoned the, the, the fishing industry entirely and um, was campaigning for, for a ban on, um, seal, on, on the trade of seal uh, products and the ban of hunting seals. 
when that was happening and indigenous people actually uh, started a campaign on their own and just raising awareness that the way they are hunting seal is uh, sustainable and is sufficient and is essential for their survival in the remote communities. Greenpeace again changed um, uh, their perspective here and they actually um, apologized to the indigenous communities for their very aggressive campaigning for that complete ban on, on hunting, on seal hunting. And that was actually refreshed also in 2000, I think it was 2015 as well, when Greenpeace um, saw themselves forced to um, issue another um, more elaborate um, apology to uh, Canadian indigenous groups. A very interesting yeah. development here. It's very interesting. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you also have a problem if you have to remove seals. Now, if you remove seals and you do not have a ban, uh, and, and you have a ban on, on seal products, is like, what do you do with all the carcasses? I mean, it's not an economically viable situation. So managing the ecosystem is also is also quite complex and in this case if you have no usage for the seal products what do you do with all the carcasses and the and all the uh, all the animals that you remove so it's uh, it's a it's a complex nut to crack what what's also very interesting if you go back to the um to the beginning of the of the campaign the com the campaign focused entirely on the white coat uh, called pups of the of the harp seals right uh, and not the um the young um animals when they actually change the color of the fur from white to uh, the so called bluebacks um no 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 sorry sorry it's a brown seal the bluebacks are for hooded seals Oh, true. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, true. Um, but hooded seals also have um, white pups. There are the, uh, two yeah. species who have white pups. Well, the uh, the first uh, the the lanugo in utero of the uh, of the hooded seal is white, but they have the the molt in utero. Yeah. Okay. So when they are when they are born, they are already uh, like silvery and silvery blue in the back, but. Um, but the, but the hooded seal is uh, unfortunately one of the one of the seal species that was hunted also, and uh, and uh, the population is not recovered, and uh, so yeah. And um, so we see the pros and the cons of that uh, of mm. a seal ban here as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I see I see this again from a from a photographer's point of view and from a from a perception point of view because this would have been harder to pull off if the seals weren't that cute. Right, um, I've just yes, recently and seen, it, and seen us in a really revealing cartoon um, from a different field where uh, a rat and a squirrel meet, and the rat asks the squirrel, "Who's doing your PR?" Because because <laughs> it, I think would it, it it would give a much bigger outcry if we did a campaign to kill squirrels than if we had a campaign to kill rats. So yeah. Yeah, it that is. Fact, that factor and also, is a really important one in the whole game. Yeah, and also, uh, like uh, when we talk about uh, about the origin of the campaign and of the killing of the animals, we have uh, questions about uh, animal welfare, uh, and uh, and the now we have the concept of humane termination of humane killing uh, of animals. And uh, the contrast between the white of the coat or the white of the ice and the blood, uh, which of course in the black and white film <laughs> is just a, a black or white uh, case, but if you see it in colors, it's even more, uh, even more emotional. It is a very emotional thing. I mean, any, any, anybody would react to this. But what yeah. was the, the 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 critics on on that? That's very true, and that's um, I think the one of the success drivers for the campaign. Um, what was the what was highly criticised by the industry is that um, the, the the same process that happens in slaughterhouses for what we what we produce our our meat for, right? Um, but we don't see it because cameras not allowed um, within slaughterhouses. So we have here um, different standards for the same um, procedure. The way um, seals got um, killed was highly criticized by animal welfare organizations, just claiming that um, that they're not killed, they're just um, injured and then basically get skinned alive. 
there have been a number of um, of studies on on that subject, which is really awkward to to talk about um, studies about how dead is a seal actually when it gets uh, skinned, yeah. and the the um, outcome was fairly interesting for me, um, saying that. Um, the by far largest amount, and we're talking here about between eighty and ninety percent of um, of the uh, the animals um, studied, have been provenly dead uh, when skinned. However, there is a kind of a, um, a movement. I forgot the the term of that. They they hmm. have um, like a swimming. Uh, movement which they um, still do even when they're dead similar to um, certain types of fishes eel for example still has mu uh, muscle constructions when it's dead mm. and yeah. that can give the impression that the animal is still alive well there is uh, and this is also I mean connecting to uh, to something closer to us uh, to human uh, death uh, and uh, the definition of, of death uh, there is uh, for 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 example for organ donation there is a legal definition of death when is a, when is a when is a human actually when 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 is it legal to take out uh, organs from a human and uh, it's uh, it's it's very complex for a marine mammal because uh, for example in Norway uh, an animal is declared dead when uh, the uh, central nervous system so the brain is. Uh, um, is destroyed when uh, the uh, blood has left the body so the animal has been bled and uh, when the heart has stopped now uh, if you look at a dissection of a seal if you kill a seal you can destroy the brains and this is was the hackapic uh, idea that uh, you make the, a hole in the cranium this is the tool right Yes, yes. So the tool is this, uh, this uh, kind of a, a, a yeah, an, an ice pick, uh, but uh, which is also used, by the way, as a safety tool for going onto the ice because you can use if you fall into the ice into the water, you can grab yourself, you can grab the ice and, and and come up on the ice. But if you see the long point can uh, of the one side of the of the hacker pick of this uh, kind of ice pick like uh, tool. Uh, can be used to come into the skull and destroy the brain. The other part, the little hammer, which is a later addition, is for actually crush the skull to start with. So uh, in the Norwegian regulations uh, that were valid for until the the hunt of small animals was or white coats was allowed, you had to first hit, hit the animal on the head with the hammer part and then turn around and go into the brain and destroy the brain. Uh, and that was the reason of the Hakapik. Then later the uh, hunt of, uh, of white coats was, was banned and uh, that's, uh, that's the end of the use of the Hakapik for, for killing. Clubbing as well with a, with a, with a big uh, like round like kitchen roll, <laughs> cake roll thing was, uh, was banned as well. And also a hook like, like a, like just a, a hook, like a you know Captain Hook's uh, hand, was also used to uh, to destroy the brains. But if you destroy the brains, that's one thing. Then you are on the ice, and uh, you can bleed the animal. So the Norwegian regulations for the hunt of of larger seals say, well, first you shoot the seal in the head, and then you have to bleed the animal. So you make cuts under the four flippers, and you let the blood out, and uh, and that's. Uh, a, a very effective method of bleeding the animals. You, it's much more effective than cutting the jugular as you do for cattle, for example, and letting the uh, the blood out of the neck because a seal's neck is very thick blubber layer, and it's very difficult to get down to that level. Um, and then, but then you have the heart has to stop, and after the seal has had the central nervous system destroyed by hackapick or by a shot. After you've bled the seal, the heart of a harp seal can still beat for an hour, out even if you take it out of the body of the seal, because of the special uh, properties of uh, of the seal muscle and especially the heart muscle that can work in anaerobiosis for a long time. And uh, so, so you have also then the muscular twitches that you were talking about. So that is legally, it's it's a it's a it's a 
problem there. It's a very and, difficult and of course, definition of, yeah. of, of death. Yeah. And then, of course, if you have to skin the seal and the seal is still moving or twitching, and if you, even if the heart is away from the body and the head is on the other side, uh, it is very, uh, it is very shocking for somebody who has never seen this before. And if you publish it on social media or if you take a film of it, it's probably going to shock a lot of people. Which is, we remember the, the campaign back in the 70s with um, celebrities mm. going up to, to, to Canada and yeah. um, hugging um, white coat seal pups, which is non, not much better because <laughs> seal pups really have a very particular smell. And if the um, and mother claws. seal comes back <laughs> in claws, <laughs> but if the mother seal comes back and the uh, seal pup doesn't smell like the seal pup anymore, then yeah. there is a chance of, uh, of rejection, right? Yeah. Um, but coming back to um, what Chris said in the beginning with uh, the cuteness factor, that actually is what um, scientists claimed, and we talked about that briefly in one of the previous episodes, uh, when it comes to krill, where we have a huge decline in, um, in stocks of krill, but it's simply not the cutest animal to campaign with. So campaigning for saving whales or saving um, seal pups, it's much easier because it's emotional, much more attached than mm -hmm. um, campaigning for small crustaceans. Mm -hmm. and, by, and, and by the way, um, krill has the big eyes and uh, it's like the same big black eyes like a seal. But maybe it's because of SpongeBob SquarePants that it's a, uh, krill it's a bug, has a bad... It's a bug in the water and uh, they have a different appeal. Um, by the way, we, we have, we've been talking very graphically about death and about how to kill an animal. Um, and that might shock some people. But if, if you eat chicken or beef or pork or any other form of uh, meat, then there are very specific regulations there as well. And uh, there are big slaughterhouses, which are factories where those are killed in the millions. So just- But, we, but we're not talking about that. That's, that's, the, that's the problem, right? That's yeah. what the um, indigenous groups are saying. The, the, the practices are right. uh, very often much more questionable in slaughterhouses than they are um, on the yeah. ice, killing a seal. Yeah, the because accusation of, is of being hypocritical. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. It's a difficult topic, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty it sure is. we will get reactions to this episode, um, <laughs> which is okay, which which we welcome. So uh, please use the, the, the feedback mechanisms that we have in place and um, mm. let us know what you think. So how do we bring this to a close? Can we? Well, I, th <laughs> well, I think, I think it's, 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 to be, it's to, to be continued. <laughs> it has been a, a, a very big um, overarching topic today, and that's um, everything's that everything connected. is connected. Yes. Exactly. So we have to make sure that the decisions we take, the, the aim we're, we're looking at is balanced and takes into account that it's just not one thing we're looking at, but a bigger picture. So when we look yeah. into... Um, into banning certain practices, which is certainly supportable, and we don't want to have um, unnecessary harm of, of of wildlife. That we don't want to have um, a plummeting livestock population. Um, but at the same time, keep in uh, in mind that it affects other populations as well. And if we have an entire ban, it affects also um, the the way. Uh, coastal population, coastal um, human um, communities um, have to deal with. And if the population not only recovers, but skyrockets as the seal heart population is doing in the Northwest Atlantic, then we also have to find a balance there. And I think that's a very um, important um, yeah, learning out of, uh, of, of that topic, but it applies for so many topics that yes. nothing happens isolated. Yeah, the uh, ecosystem is a complex uh, system. Humans are part of it. If we change some parts of it, as we have done and we keep on doing, we uh, have to be careful uh, about stopping or uh, acting upon it because there might be effects that, uh, that we have not seen and they might be detrimental to the whole picture and to the health and the stability of the system that supports our life and the life of every organism on the planet all right so 
That brings us to the end of this episode. Um, I just realized during the later parts of this episode that we probably want to record a content warning to put in the beginning, <laughs> just to make sure that people know what to expect and what we will, will be talking about. But we'll record this after the episode and glue it to the front. And um, yeah, I guess with that, we are about done here. Thanks for being here and uh, say hello on, on the social media. Bye-bye, everyone.